Thanks very much. Uh, I'll start with some basic, ver very basic stuff, definitions, and then, uh, and then move on. Uh, my, my talk will come, my two lectures will concentrate on the use of uh, linear programming and uh, as, as a methodology for, for designing online algorithms. So feel free to stop and ask questions at any, any point of time. Um, yeah. Okay. So we'll, just a quick, uh, quick review. I'm sure everybody knows uh, what's what's an online algorithm. It, it's an algorithm that gets the input in pieces. Each time the algorithm gets a request, has to respond to it. Uh, there is no going back. Um, and the, so, how how do, how do we measure the performance of such an algorithm? Well, for, we, for this, we have the measure is called competitive, uh, competitive factor. And we say that an algorithm is alpha, alpha competitive if for every request sequence, the performance of the online algorithm, meaning the cost of the, of the online algorithm, normalized by the cost of an optimal algorithm which knows the full request sequence in advance but still has to pay something. If this normalized cost is upper bounded by alpha for every request sequence, then we say that the algorithm is uh, alpha competitive. We can also use randomization, but then again, the algorithm uses random bits, but we want the, so now we're looking at the expected performance for every request sequence. Expectation is taken over the random bits used by, by the algorithm. And we say that for a randomized algorithm, the algorithm is alpha competitive if the ratio between the expectation and the optimal cost is at most, uh, is at most alpha. And in, the, in these talks, I'm only going to assume that we have the, the adversary is oblivious, meaning that the, 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 the adversary knows, <coughs> knows the, the algorithm, but not the outcome of the random bits. OK, let's start with the most basic online problem called ski, ski problem. We go on a ski vacation, renting skis cost cost $1 per day, buying them costs B dollars. I won't tell you what is B. Um, the, the problem is that we don't know how many days of vacation we're going, uh, we're going to have. So the question is rent, rent or buy. This issue comes up in lots of algorithmic uh, scenarios. Um, there, for, for a deterministic algorithm, the, um, the algorithm is, uh, is, is very simple. We just rent for a certain number of days, and then, and then, and then we buy. Now, for how many days should we, should we rent? Well, the optimal choice, so M is the number of, uh, of rental days. The optimal choice of M is, of course, B. So if the number of days is less than of ski days is less than b then we will be we will be doing the same as the optimal solution if the number is more than b then we have accumulated enough credit to pay for both the rental and 
the, and buying the skis because together the, that costs 2B and we know that any algorithm had to pay at least B. So the competitive factor, of competitive ratio here is 2 and this is actually optimal. Okay, uh, linear programming, I think we all know. Uh, we have a bunch of linear inequalities or equalities, a linear, um, a linear objective function, min or max. Uh, I'm, I'm, in, in the online setting, as we will see, we're not going to, to, uh, to solve an LP, but we will, we will do it iteratively. Um, I'll, in, in the first, in the first hour, I'll be talking a lot about set cover. So just a quick, uh, just a quick reminder. We have a universe and elements. We have uh, a family of subsets, S1 through uh, SM. I assume that every set has some cost CI. The goal in set cover is to find uh, to find a, a, a collection of minimum cost of this of these subsets, so that it covers the whole uh, the full the full universe. We can write this as an integer uh, integer linear program. This is a good good exercise if you're not familiar with this this kind of formulations. So we have a variable x i. This is our indicator whether we pick pick or not the ith set. For each element, we want it to be covered. So sigma xi over all the sets that contain it should be at least one. And we want to minimize the sum sigma ci xi. So this is the integer program. We relax it by allowing the, the xi values to get fractional values between 0 and, and 1. Now, this means that the sum of the fraction, for each element, the, the sum of the fractions of the sets containing it should be at least, uh, should be at least 1. And this is an LP, which can be solved in uh, polynomial time. OK, how do we go from a, frac from a fractional solution to a, uh, to, to an integral, so, so set cover is an NP hard problem. So how do we how do we go from a fractional solution to uh, to an to an approximate integral solution? One classic technique, which I'll also be using in the online setting, is randomized rounding. We can think of the so we have the output is we solved the LP. We have an optimal fractional solution. Um, and now in, ra in randomized rounding, we think of these fractions as, as probabilities. And so we pick each element with the correspond, I'm sorry, e each set with a corresponding, uh, with a corresponding probability. Now, in terms of the expectation of the solution, this will give us precisely the the fraction, the cost of the fractional solution. However, this is not enough for covering. We can only guarantee that each element is covered with probability, or is not covered with probability at most one over e. But this is this is not enough. So we we need to amplify this probability by t by repeating the experiment log n o of log n times or a priori. Uh, multiplying the probabilities by, by log n. And this will uh, guarantee that we are going to cover each element with very high, uh, very high probability. And of course, the cost will go up by, by a factor of log n. Uh, the classic algorithm for, for set cover uh, is, the greedy, is the greedy algorithm, very natural algorithm. Um, it says the following. Uh, uh, we, we start iterating until we, have, until we cover all the elements. Um, at any point of time, we pick the set which minimizes the, the cost 
its cost divided by the number of new elements which are added to the uh, cover. So we can think of it, we're, we're looking for the set which has the minimum average cost in terms of the cover, the, the residual coverage that it, that it offers. There are many ways to analyze this, this algorithm. Let me, show you one, let me show you one way through uh, dual fitting since, since I'll be talking about the dual of set cover and also about, uh, about dual, dual fitting. So what's the dual program of, of set cover? Well, in duality, um, we, have, we have a dual variable for every primal constraint so that that's going to be y, yj for every, uh, uh, for, 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 every, uh, for every element. We want to maximize, the objective function is maximizing the sum of the yi's. And now the constraint is that for every set si, the sum of the yj's is at most the cost of that, uh, of that set. This is the packing, uh, packing problem. Um, OK, so now how do we use the dual for analyzing the primal algorithm? So the primal algorithm is a combinatorial algorithm. It doesn't know anything about the LP, of course. It's just a simple, greedy algorithm. And uh, so we need, a need, we need a way of setting the, the, dual, the dual variables in accordance with what the primal, the primal does. So uh, something is wrong here with the, with the, with the font, but the idea is that every, every dual variable, the value that it's going to get is equal to the, co to the, to the cost of the set uh, uh, at the moment of, the, of its coverage, but uh, so, so if, if, if we use a certain set, CI, and use it to cover 100 elements, then each of these elements is going to be set the value of CI, CI divided by 100. So this way, we're going to recover the dual is going to recover the precise cost of the primal algorithm. The value of the dual, uh, each dual variable is equal to the marginal cost of covering it. What about feasibility? So let's see by, we're going to, obviously we're going to violate feasibility uh, because we're talking here about an NP-hard problem. Let's see, let's see what happens. So let's look at a certain set S. And let's suppose its elements were covered in the order E1, E2, up to, uh, up to EK. This may have happened in one shot, of course, but let's just serialize this. So we know that when element EI is covered, we could have picked the set S. And at that point of time, there were at least K minus I plus one uncovered elements, right? So this gives us an upper bound on the value of the dual variable yei. So when we sum up over all the elements in the set, we get the harmonic uh, uh, series. So the sum of the yi's is at most the cost of the set s multiplied by the harmonic number, which is approximately lan, lan lan k, if the set has k, k elements. So this proves that the, perf so, so we know that each dual constraint is, is violated by a logarithmic factor. If we divide everything by log factors, we get a feasible assignment for the dual variables. However, the, the ratio between the primal objective function and the dual objective function is is going to be logarithmic. So note, what, what is the role which is being played by the dual problem? By weak duality, we know that the, the, dual, the dual always gives us a lower, any dual feasible dual solution provides 
a lower bound on any primal solution, in particular the optimal, uh, the optimal solution. So we, using the greedy algorithm, the primal algorithm, we have defined uh, uh, a, a feasible dual solution. And since the ratio between the two objective functions is at most log, this is also the approximation factor. OK, let's move to the online primal dual uh, uh, framework. I'll start with covering problems. And let's start with the ski problem. Let's go back to the, to the ski problem. So what else can be said about the ski problem? I, I mean, the two, we saw the simple two approximation, trivial two approximation. We know that it's tight. However, that's only true deterministically. Let's talk about the fractional, a fractional solution for the, ski, uh, for the ski problem. So the first step is formulating the problem as an LP. Now, formulating the ski problem as an LP is maybe not as natural as, as formulating set cover, but it's actually very simple. So we have a variable x, which is the indicator for buying or not buying the skis. And for every day of ski, we have a, an indicator zi, which is renting or not, not renting. We want to minimize bx plus, so this is the, this is the cost of buying the skis, plus sigma, sigma zi. And the constraint for each day is that it is covered either by buying or by renting. So x plus zi is bigger than 1. OK, let's look at the uh, relaxation of this problem. Now we allow the, uh, the, uh, the x, x variable and the zi's to, be, uh, to, be, to have values between 0 and 1. Now, what does it mean in the online uh, in the online setting? Uh, what's what's a fraction? What's a fractional solution? Well, we get a new every day. We get a new constraint. We get the ith constraint x plus z i, and we have to uh, we have to satisfy that constraint. Now, uh, yeah. What is the k over there then? There's a the number of of days, right? Uh, yeah, where do you see a K? Oh, yeah, that's that's the number of days. It's true. This is this is not known. Uh, this is it not known changes, in right? advance. But pardon? It also changes, right? Uh, let's say it, the, the, this is. I'm looking at the final at the final LP. Sure. I mean, we. It's true. We don't know K uh, K in advance. So, the constraints appear one one by one. Uh, every day. We get a, con a new const we get an, a new constraint of the form x plus z i bigger than or equal to one, and the 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 online requirement is monotonicity, which means that we uh, the, the interesting variable is x because z i is just for the i uh, is just for the i day. It means that x is a monotone, non-decreasing function. We cannot sell back one-tenth of the equipment to the, to the store. So x has to, uh, can, only, can only grow. It cannot, it cannot decrease. OK. So here's the dual of the, here's the, dual of the, of the ski, uh, of, of, of the primal LP. We have a, we have a dual variable yi for every, for every day. And we want to maximize sigma, sigma yi. And the dual constraints are that for every day, yi. So this is a maximization problem. So we have to upper bound the, uh, the variables or, the, or l the linear constraints. So for every day, yi is at most 1. And the sum of the yi's is at most, uh, is at most b. And, the, and these, the primal constraints, appear one by one. OK, what's the algorithm? So the algorithm is a basic 
It's, a, it's based on multiplicative updates. So initially x is 0. We don't own any fraction of the, of the solution. As long as we haven't bought all of the, all of the equipment, we need to, to uh, satisfy the, the constraints. So we set zi to be 1 minus x. So now the constraint x plus zi is satisfied. But since we have, we have acquired some credit, because we, we're going to do at least one day of ski, so we update x multiplicatively. So this, this happens to be the multiplicative uh, uh, update. I'll, I'll talk later on how we, uh, uh, where, where, where does it come from. Now, <coughs> so let's, yeah? A little bit nitpicking, but wouldn't it be better to first update x? To, to do what? Update X first, or it doesn't matter. Oh, and then sure, yeah, it just helps a little bit the analysis. This is the only, this is the only issue. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, this is what, what you're suggesting is definitely better. Just simplifies the, the the analysis. Okay. So we know that the primal solution is feasible just by just by design. So uh, so this we have. Let's see what is the ratio. So we know that eventually the ratio between the primal and the dual, this is going to be our competitive factor. So let's see what is the ratio between the increase in primal and the increase in dual. It's 1 plus 1 over c. This is, this is just the, uh, the algorithm to remind you. The change in dual is 1. Remember, we increased the dual by 1. The change in primal, well, it's b times delta x plus zi, which turns out to be 1 plus 1 over c. So this is the ratio between primal and, uh, and dual. Uh, what, about, what about feasibility? So what? One constraint is that yi is less than or equal to 1. That's satisfied uh, by, by, by definition. What about the other constraints? Sigma yi less than or equal to, uh, to b. So we need to prove that after b days, we're going to buy the, the equipment. And then we don't need to increase the y's anymore. And that would prove the dual fe feasibility. So that's actually easy, easy to show. Um, <coughs> the, uh, since, since we have here a linear, the, the update is done by a, linea, a linear function, the, the value of the x variable is determined by, by geometric sequence. And when we do the calculation, we get that this is, this is the value of x after b after b days. So we need to make sure that, the, that c is less than or equal to 1 plus 1 over b to the power of b and, and minus 1. And this goes, to, uh, this goes to e. So we get that the competitive factor is 1 plus 1 over c, which goes to e over e minus 1 as b, as b grows. So this is our competitive, this is our competitive uh, factor for the randomized, uh, for, for, sorry, for the fractional algorithm. But what, what can we do with, it, with this fractional algorithm? So one way of viewing it is that the fractional result is a goal by itself, and this is true. In many cases, I'm not sure in the, that this is true in the, in, the, in the case of ski, but in this case, going, going from a fractional, a deterministic fractional algorithm to a randomized integral uh, algorithm is very natural. And this is actually the path that we're going to take in many of these problems. We will first generate a fractional algorithm, 
a deterministic one, and then we'll turn it into an integral, integral, integral randomized algorithm. Now, um, and unfortunately, generating the fractional algorithm, for that we can develop general techniques. Going from fractional to integral randomized, that's more problem-specific. Uh, problem in this special case of the ski problem, it's easy to, uh, to, to, get a fraction, to get a randomized algorithm. So look at the 0, 1 interval. x1, x2, x, x3, etc. are the increments of, of x. So this is the growth of x uh, every day. The randomized algorithm is going to choose a value d uniformly at random in the zero one, in the zero one interval, and that will determine uh, the day in which we will buy uh, uh, in which we will buy the equipment. And so, if, for example, if d falls in this subinterval. Uh, uh, covered by x3, then we will buy the equipment on the third day. So clearly, uh, the probability of, buy, of buying the equipment on the ith day is xi. And the probability, and it's not hard to show that the probability of renting it on the ith day is at most zi. So it turns out that in expectation, the, the expected cost of the randomized algorithm is the same as the determin is the same as the fractional algorithm, which means that we have a fractional algorithm which has uh, uh, w w whose competitive factor is e over e minus one. This is just there. There are other ways of obtaining uh, of obtaining this uh, this result. So this is a very uh, a very easy way of uh, uh, this is I think the simplest example that I can think of using this uh, uh, primal dual uh, technique for online algorithms. Let's go to uh, uh, let's go beyond the the ski problem. So uh, in this in the case of the ski problem, if you think of the uh, of the constraint matrix in the LP, all the entries are in 0, 1, but with a very special structure, of course. Let's say, wh what can we say about a general matrix where the entries are 0, 1? This is exactly a, an instance of the, of the set cover problem. So let's talk about the online set cover problem. We have elements. We have the set system. We have the costs, as before. But in the online setting, the elements appear one by one. Each time an element uh, shows up, we need, to, uh, we need to cover it. And once we pick a set, it cannot be, uh, it, uh, we cannot sell it back to the store like, the, like in the case, same as, as this ski equipment, we cannot unchoose, uh, we cannot unchoose this set. And we may, I mean, we can think of both, uh, both, both models are legitimate where we know in advance the structure of the, we know the set system, we just don't know which elements are going to show up. This is one possibility. And the other possibility is when an element shows up, it tells us to which sets it belongs. The algorithm that I'm going to show, to, to, to show here works for both, uh, for both models. OK, so remember this is the LP for, uh, for the set cover problem. So x, x of s is the indicator for set, for set s. We want to minimize sigma cs xs. We want to cover every, every element. The constraints now appear, as before, one by one. Uh, we need to satisfy a constraint upon arrival. And uh, variables can only, be, uh, can only be increased. 
Here is the dual. We've seen it already. So y of e is the dual, dual variable. And the sum of the yes is at most the cost of the set for each set s. And we want to maximize sigma ye. So sigma ye is going to be our lower bound on for the optimal cost. It, will pl it plays the role of opt. OK, I'll show you two, two algorithms. Uh, one is a discrete one which generalizes the multiplicative update ideas from the ski problem and also a continuous view of that, uh, of this discrete algorithm. Um, OK, so initially all the x values are 0. When a new element arrives, we run the following loop until it's covered. So as long as sigma xs of the element of the sets which contain that element, as long as that sum is at most 1, we increase y in, in every iteration here of, the, of this while loop, as long as uh, we, we increase ye by 1. And we do a multiplicative update over the x variables. And this multiplicative update is inversely proportional to the cost of the set. So we want, so for element e, sets which, uh, which contain e but are cheap, we want the x their x value to go up relatively fast while expensive sets will uh, increase at a, slower, uh, at a slower rate. The proof of the competitive factor is very similar to what we saw in the, in the case of the ski problem. We need to show primal feasibility, dual feasibility, and of course bound the ratio between the primal increase and the dual, and the dual increase. OK, primal feasibility is just by design because this while loop just goes, uh, just goes on until, until, we cover the, until we cover the element. Um, what about the ratio between primal and dual? So in every iteration of the, of the, while, of the while loop, we increase ye by 1. So the change in the dual variable is 1. And we do a multiplicative update over the sets uh, uh, that, that, con that contain e. So what is delta p? Well, it's sigma c of s, the cost of s, multiplied by the change in x of s which is equal to C of s multiplied by the change in cost uh, for, for, every, for every subset s. And uh, well, C of s cancels out. And we get here two, uh, two terms, the sum of two terms, sigma x of s and sigma 1 over m. Well, x of s, we know this is at most 1 because we're not feasible yet. That's why we're in this loop. So the first term is upper bounded by 1. And the second term is also upper bounded by 1 because we have at most uh, m sets. So overall, uh, it's, at, it's at most 2. So the ratio between primal and dual is, is at most 2. What about feasibility? Well. Similarly to what we had in the case of, of ski, we have here a geometric, uh, the, the, for, for every, for every the, the x is the sum of a, of, a geometric, uh, of a geometric series. So if we focus on one set, then x of s increases for every increase of y of e when e belongs to the set s. We start from the initial value of x of s is 1 over m times the cost. And q in the geometric sequence is 1 plus 1 over c of s. 
And if, if we run this for c of s times log m rounds, we get that x after these many rounds, these many iterations, iter I mean iterations of this while loop, the value of x of s is at least 1. And then we don't need, just, just one second, and then we don't need to uh, increase x, x of s anymore. And note that each increase of x of s is uh, triggered by an increase in y of e. So uh, once x of s reaches 1, we don't need to increase the y's anymore. Yeah? Uh, do you do some kind of normalization where cs has to be at least 1? Or... With, with, with what? It, what is the normalization for the cost? Is cs at, at least 1? I'm assuming that it, it's at least 1, yeah. Um, so, so we so we get that the du that the dual constraint is uh, is violated by at most a factor of uh, a factor of log m. Uh, so, so the so again, dividing uh, ma to make the 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 dual the, the dual the dual solution feasible, we just divide it by log m. So we get a, fraction, a fractional solution, uh, which is feasible. And the ratio between the primal and the dual is 1 over O of 1 over log, uh, log m. And actually, this result is, uh, is tight for a, fractional, for a fractional algorithm. Uh, yeah. Let me show you now a second algorithm the continuous, so it's actually the continuous, continuous counterpart of the, of the discrete algorithm. So in the continuous algorithm, in the continuous algorithm, we guess the connection between the primal and the dual, uh, dual variables. I'll tell you shortly how, uh, how, how we do that. But this, the, the, uh, the primal variable is determined by an exponential, exponential function of the dual variables. And this happens to be the, the, the choice for the, for, this, for the set cover problem. So now the algorithm is continuous. We start increasing the variables y of e at a constant rate. And that determines the value uh, for every set s. That determines the value of x of s. And this is done after, uh, until we, the, the constraint is satisfied. So y of e is increased. And it's, since this is a monotone increasing function, at some point uh, uh, the, the, the variable y of e is going to be, uh, sorry, the element e is going to be fractionally covered. The proof of the competitive factor is again similar to what, what we've already seen. We just, here we show that the ratio between the derivatives is is, uh, is logarithmic. So what happens here is that the primal and the dual are, well, primal is feasible by design. Dual solution turns out to be feasible. And, and the ratio between the primal and dual increase is logarithmic. And so we get a logarithmic, uh, a logarithmic competitive, uh, competitive ratio. And um, yeah, so primal feasibility is by design. Um, let's see. Yeah, now we want to show uh, what is the ratio between the, uh, the primal and the dual increase. So we'll, uh, between the, it's continuous uh, process. So we look at the ratio between the derivatives. Well, the dual is increasing in, uh, constant rate. So this, the derivative is equal to, uh, to 1. 
Uh, what about the primal change? Well, we're using the fact that the rate of, it's an exponential function, so the rate of change is equal to the value of the function, and when we do the, and when we do the calculations, we get that it's at most logarithmic in M, and again, at the final step, we get the familiar, uh, the familiar expression where we sum up x of s plus uh, 1 over m, and we bound separately each of these terms. The first term is upper bounded by 1 because we don't have, uh, because we don't have uh, a fe yet a feasible solution. And the second term is, is also upper bounded by 1 because we have at most m, m sets. Um, so that's the ratio between prim primal and dual growth. As for, fe as for feasibility, we use the fact that x of s is at most, is at most 1. And from that, we infer that the sum of the y's is at most uh, c of s. So we get dual, uh, we get dual uh, feasibility. What's the connection between the, two, uh, uh, between the two algorithms? Well, we use the fact that 1 over. Can you say again that why it was uh, Yeah. Uh, we just use the fact that x of s is upper bounded by, uh, is upper bounded by 1. And uh, so, so we have this inequality, and, that imp and this implies this inequality. Ah, I see. Okay. Okay. Um, so, wh what's the connection between the discrete and the uh, and the continuous algorithm? Well, we use the fact that one plus one over c is an expo is a approximately uh, e to the power of one over uh, one over c, as long as c is not uh, is not uh, too 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 small. The description of the discrete algorithm is simpler, but the, con the, con the analysis of the continuous algorithm is, I think, a bit, uh, a bit more, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit simpler. Soon I'll show you another way of, of uh, describing the, the, co the continuous, uh, the continuous algorithm. Okay. Um, what about mul the multiplicative updates? So suppose we have a, a general covering problem. So in a covering problem, we have uh, so the primal the primal uh, uh, objective function is sigma c i x i, and the constraint matrix is non uh, is non negative. So we have non negative values in the constraint matrix. So each time we get a new constraint, the teeth constraint and the teeth uh, step, we have sigma a i x i bigger than or equal to b t. And we do a multiplicative update, which is equal to 1 in, in the general case. In the case of set cover, it was 1 plus 1 over c. Here it's going to be 1 plus a i divided by c i. A i is the coefficient of x i in the new constraint, and c i is the coefficient in the, <coughs> in the objective function. And y is increased by 1. So loc from the local perspective, the change in the primal cost is sigma c i delta x i, which is equal to sigma a i x i, but we know that this is at most bt because bt, because the constraint is not at this point is not yet satisfied, and this is exactly the change in the dual dual cost. So this is just to give some intuition where the how how these values are uh, are determined. Okay, what about lower bound? Let's see a very simple uh, a very simple lower bound. Suppose our objective function is sigma xj. The first constraint I'm going to give you is the, the xi's need to sum up to at least 1. Well, we have to set them somehow, but one of these guys 
is at least 1 over n, right? So let's call it x1. Second constraint will be x2 up to xn is at least 1. Well, one of these guys has to be is at least 1 over n minus 1. Let's call him x2. And so on. The last constraint is xn bigger than or equal to 1. And uh, we have to set it to be at least 1. Offline could se just set xn to be equal to 1. And uh, the others are set to 0. So the opt is 1. We pay 1 over n for x1, 1 over n minus 1 for x2, etc. We get the harmonic sequence, so we pay ln n. So we, we can see that this logarithmic <coughs> competitive factor is actually un uh, unavoidable even in this uh, simple scenarios. I'm talking about the fractional solution. OK, how do we go to a randomized, to a randomized algorithm? So for the, for the set, online set cover problem, I'm just going to apply the good old randomized rounding that you have seen earlier. But instead of applying it only once, as you do in the offline case, I'm just going to do it in increments. So whenever I increment my x of s by some delta, then I also pick it to my cover with this probability. Of course, I have to amplify the probability by a logarithmic factor by factor of log n so that I, ha so, so, so that I get coverage with high, uh, high probability. So the competitive factor turns out to be log m. This is the loss in the fractional case multiplied by log n, which is the loss in when we do the amplification of the randomized, uh, of the randomized rounding. This is almost tight. The lower bound for, for the integral version is log m log n divided by log log factor. And surprisingly, this, this process can be de-randomized uh, uh, online. So we can get this result also uh, deterministically. And it's in the, the way the way it's the way it's done it's um, we take the we use the method of con of conditional probabilities and and apply, apply it uh, uh, online and the, this way you get the the deterministic bound okay let's see an example which which has a slightly different flavor. So, so far we have tried, to, uh, the goal was to minimize the cost of a cover. Now let's, let's look from the perspective of the dual or a maximization problem. So a simple, uh, simple example is what's called online virtual circuit route, uh, routing. We have, we have a graph. We have capacities on the edges. We get requests. Each request is specified by a sort and a sink. And we want to connect SI to TI by a path in the network. We have, remember, we have capacities. And we can also reject the request and then lose the profit. And so we send, for every request, we send one unit. And this is, our, this is our gain. And we cannot do rerouting. Um, OK, so this is our LP. We want to maximize the sum of, the, uh, so RIP, this is the variable of the ith request. And this is the amount of flow that we send on path P which connects SI, uh, SI and TI. And uh, so now this can, 
this is an LP, so this can be a fractional, fractional value. Uh, this, this, this sum for every request of the fractional flow is upper bounded by, is upper bounded by one. And for every edge E, the amount of flow that can go, fractional flow that can go through it is at most its capacity UE. Okay, the dual, uh, the dual packing problem is, uh, sorry, this is, let's, let's stick with uh, uh, dual is the maximization problem and uh, 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 the primal problem is the, min, is the minimization problem. So the, pro, the, the primal in this case, well, we have a variable xe for every, uh, for, for this constraint, and so we want to minimize sigma ue xe plus sigma z of ri, which is the constraint, correspond, which is the variable corresponding to, uh, to this constraint. And for every path, we need to cover it. So there are two ways of covering it. We have a global variable xe, which would work for all requests. So sigma xe plus uh, z uh, plus zr zri, which is specific for each uh, for each request. And now here we have the the columns appearing uh, appearing one by one. And again, we have a monotonicity uh, requirement. We cannot decrease the flow on any uh, on any path. So here is the so here is the primal dual uh, the primal dual algorithm. So um, as as long as we have a path. Who's, so remember, the dual con in, or the, pri the primal constraint specifies that the length of every path is at least one, whether it comes from x or from z. So if the length, so if I, I get now a particular request, if the length of every path is at least one with respect to the x variables, then there, I've already satisfied from the perspective of the primal, everything is fine, and I'm not going to send any flow for that request. I don't need it for my primal dual uh, algorithm. Of course, in practice, we will uh, send flow. And just one thing. So, yeah. what is the ZRI? So, it's a penalty that we pay if we don't satisfy? I, I, Okay, if you don't have enough, if you don't have enough money from the x variables, yeah, then you use the z, then you use the v, z variable. And as you can see, if there is a path, uh, if there is a path whose x length is at most is at most one, then um, then you set z to be equal to one. There is no need to be more precise, uh, more precise than that. And then you update multiplicatively the x variables along the path. So now note, uh, 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 our online algorithm is not generating a fractional solution. It's generating right away an integral solution. Either we send uh, and so, and y is said to be equal to one. So either we send one unit of flow on this path, with, whose x length is strictly less than one, or we don't send any any flow. So we get an integral for for, for the flow solution. We get an integral. We get an integral solution. Let's see the analysis. Uh, the primal is feasible again by design. Either the excess, sorry. Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, uh, I'm not sure if I understand correctly, but don't you want uh, that um, banded on all the edges? On the, um, I mean, this is here. I'm looking at the sum. So I'm I'm looking if the, if there is a path whose x length is strictly less than one, then I, I can pick any of these paths. I don't care which one. And I'll send one unit of flow on that path. But then you 
we want to pass shouldn't be shouldn't we have um, consider all the edges like um, shouldn't all the x e of the e in the pass be one this is exactly what's written here sigma over all e and p so some of them might be like disconnected in the but path. it's a path e. oh okay sorry e in the you. path it's a, it's a it's a it's a path so um, yeah so the primal solution is, fe is feasible the length is at least one either through the x variables or uh, or with help from the z variable um, we can see that in, uh, we'll see that in every iteration, the change between p and uh, the primal and the dual is at most three. The dual is going to be uh, uh, we're going to violate capacities, but will bound uh, will will bound uh, the the violation. So so primal, as I said, is feasible by by design. The ratio between the primal and the dual, it's going to be done, it's proved similarly to the previous, uh, previous example. Um, and this can be shown to be at most, uh, at most uh, three. Again, we use the fact that the sum of the x, the path that we chose, the sum of the xe's is at most uh, is at most one. As for the uh, dual feasibility, well, uh, again, we have the, the sum of the flows is determined by a geometric, uh, a ge a geometric uh, sorry, the x, xe is the sum of a geometric uh, sequence. And we know that once xe hits one, any path containing that edge E has uh, length one, so we're not going to push any flow on, on that. So the question is, how fast does Xe uh, reach one? And when we do the calculation, it takes at most U of E times log N iterations, so this is the maximum amount of flow on edge uh, on edge E, uh, so uh, we violate the capacity by at most a logarithmic, uh, at most a logarithmic factor. So we get here a three-competitive algorithm wh which violates uh, 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 capacities by at most a factor of log of log n. We can change the algorithm by a little bit, we still have multiplicative up, updates, but a slightly different update, uh, 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 update function, and that results in an algorithm which does not violate, capa which does not violate capacity constraint, and with this expression t uh, tells us what is the what is the competitive factor, we, and, and it's a function of the minimum capacity. And if this minimum capacity is at least logarithmic, then we get that the algorithm is log n competitive. We're not without violating capacity constraint. This result was obtained earlier by uh, Azar Averbuch and Plotkin. Um, how much more time do I have for a uh, yeah, couple of minutes? Couple, I'll try to wrap up the first half. Uh, so, um, so far, what, what we have seen is we have either rows in a appearing in a covering LP or columns in a, in a, in a packing LP. Primal variables are updated, are updated uh, multiplicatively. The dual variables are updated, updated in an additive in an additive way. All the the proofs had the following structure: we show primal feasibility, 
we show dual either feasibility or almost feasibility. And we also bound the ratio between the primal change and the and the, du and the dual change. Sometimes since the solution is only nearly feasible, then this nearly goes into the competitive, uh, competitive factor. Uh, going, so this is for the fractional solution. Going for the integral, for an integral solution, then this is a more sometimes randomized rounding uh, works. Uh, in general, this is a more ad hoc uh, 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 process. So the idea is that looking at, at online problems from, from this per perspective gives you a more principled way of designing, designing an online algorithm. And you don't, you can replace in many cases, you can replace a potential function by the dual or the primal objective function, depending from which perspective uh, uh, you're working, and that and that gives you the base, uh, some uh, the, the basis of reference with respect to which you do your competitive analysis. Another advantage is that since we're working with an LP, the competitiveness is proved with respect to a fractional solution, and which sometimes has its advantages. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop for, uh, for a break at this point. OK, thanks. <laughs> time for one or two quick questions. So just a, a quick comment. So you always say that the multiplicative update, but that, that what that? That it's a multiplicative update in the primal, but it's not true. It's both multiplicative and additive, right? Right. They, right. they go together. True. So it's a bit more complicated than that. That's true. Yeah, it's sometimes modified to be only multiplicative. Okay. How? Um, in most cases, if you start with a small number, it's need to be multiplicative. Yeah, but I think the point is actually that we want to work together with both primal and dual uh, dual var and then you're right. We have to we have to do both. Uh, I'll, in a minute, I mean, ne the next talk I'll I'll uh, I'll show another way of viewing it, which might be more natural, might be partially answering your uh, your uh, your co your comment. Uh, some more questions. Let's take, Let's take it. Let's take it.